uh, and yesterday we saw ADS for the first time. We saw anti deceiver. It's a space time that has many incarnations. You can see it in very different ways that look totally different. It's a space time that has a boundary. But what is the boundary? It depends how you think a little bit. Sometimes the boundary is a copy of flat space, a copy of RD here at z equal to 0. Sometimes you can think of the boundary of where this hyperbole, hyperboloid asymptotes, which is the, a light ray. So the set of light rays, each light ray gives you a point where you are going to. So the, sp the set of light rays is also a way of describing the boundary of this spacetime. This spacetime is also equivalent to the cylinder, and then there is the inside of the cylinder and the boundary. The boundary is the cylinder, and the boundary in that case would be the cylinder. And so this was ADS. Now, why are these equal signs true? Is what you are going to see in tomorrow's tutorial. And uh, today? Tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow, tomorrow is Saturday. OK, so probably today. In today's tutorial, you will be exploring why exactly this equal signs. And uh, we will come back, we will continue a little bit with ADS today, but then I want to get, stay, take a break from ADS for a few days to give you time to do the homework and uh, to finish the tutorial. If you didn't finish today, I think it's really important that you spend time getting familiar with this space time. And then we'll come back to the space time when I will feel like you are already familiar with it by having played with it both in the tutorial and in the homework and reviewed the tutorial if needed. It's a really important tutorial and homework. So please go through in detail, and then you will become a, an, a specialist in this particular very symmetric space time. OK. So today, we will close some. Uh, I want to close some loose ends, motivate the homework that uh, you are going to do, which is related to exploring the physics of this space time. But I want to first uh, recall a few basic things about quantum field theory that uh, you probably know, but it's useful to recall. So one thing is, suppose you have a curved space-time like this. This grid represents there is some metric, some curved metric at each point of space-time. And in this curved space-time, you have a scalar field. Right? You have particles. And you have a particle that you want to study the propagator from point P to point Q of this space-time. And you want to do it for a heavy particle. Okay, so you have a heavy particle, and you want to study the quantum propagation from one point to the other. What is it given by? What is this given by? Is it uh, obvious? If not, let me remind you a little bit. So that's a question that we are going to address. What is this approximately equal to? It's one thing I want to remind you about. So this is one of the goals that we are going to do today. Okay, so this can be point, this will be point number two. Point number one of what we are going to ask today is suppose we do a C we are studying a conformal field theory, which is a free theory. We start free plus some perturbation theory. So the quantum effects are small. You start free, and then you turn on some quantum effects. Right? And the question we ask here is, how does it work? How could we start with some free theory, where our propagator is something like 1 over x minus y to some power, say 2, if we are in four dimensions, and we have the dimension of our scalar field would be 1. How do we go from 2 to a, a quantum number, a quantum dimension? 2 is the classical dimension of the field. How does that 2 get corrected and become 2.3? What happens in perturbation theory? How, how will we change that 2 into 2.3? And that's a question we are going to ask as well. What does perturbation theory do with respect to this classical dimension? And then the last point we are going to see today is we are going to combine these points, 1 plus 2, 
in anti deceiver space, and this is what this homework is about. Well, not exactly perturbation theory, but there are some ideas from perturbation theory that are useful to have in mind, not to be surprised by some results that you will get in the, in the homework. Okay, so this is the plan for today. Any questions about the lecture so far or about what I've said? So let's start then with a free scalar field plus some perturbation. The perturbation can be some quartic interaction from lambda phi to the force. Eh? And let's consider a correlation function of a composite operator. Say at the point x, I'll put phi square of x. Phi square of x, phi square of y. This is an operator. It's what's called a composite operator. Note that this is not the same as phi of x1, phi of x2, and x1 goes to x2. No, this is different. You put phi of x, phi square of x at the same point. Right? It's a new operator. It's a, the operator phi square at point x. Right? Sometimes you can say, you can remind yourself that when you do perturbation theory, two propagators leave phi, but they never self-contract. Right? And to remind yourself, sometimes we put some dots like this to remind ourselves we don't self-contract the fields. That's what these dots mean, normal ordering. But provided we know what we are thinking, we are what we are doing, we don't need them. But why not? In case someone is watching. Okay. And now what would be this correlation function if I'm computing this? Well, in perturbation theory, each operator, each field is phi square. So I represent each field like this. This is position x. This is position y. And then I just we contract them. I just consider a propagator. One propagator, another propagator. That's what I would get if the theory was free. Just two propagators. So what would be this result? What would this give me? In equations. One divided by what? X minus y to the power four. X minus y to the power four. Does everyone agree with four? Four. Just four. Phi is a free scalar, right? In 4D. In 4D, good. In 4D. And so phi, as I mentioned, one, the propagator of phi is just one over x minus y squared. You have two propagators, you have the square of that, which is one over x minus y to the four. And so this means that this composite operator has classical dimension, let's write delta classical equal to two. two. Very good. Huh? Two plus two, four. Very good. But then uh, this is not the end of the story, right? So now we have perturbation theory. So we start doing Feynman diagrams. And the next term is plus. And now we need to add the Feynman diagram where we have here some lambda pi to the four interaction at say point Z. This is point X, this is point Y. Right? Plus dot dot dot. But let's study this quantum correction. Right? So what is this? This is, we have this point Z. You are probably not very used to doing perturbation theory in position space, but we can do it in position space. It's not a big deal. We just write directly in position space. We integrate over the location of this point Z. And then what's the propagator from X to Z? X minus Z square. And we have two of these propagators. And then what's the propagator between Z and Y? It's Z minus Y square, and we have two of these propagators. So X minus Z to the four, Y minus Z to the four, and a lambda here measuring the couple. Now, see that this quantum effect, Z, you integrate over Z all over space-time, 
And when z goes to x, this blows up. And when z goes to y, this blows up. Right? So let's analyze the, this integral by zooming in close to each of them. So let's shift the quadrat of integration. So first, let's say that this is approximately equal to twice, twice because whatever happens close to one point, it will be the same in the other point. So let me just zoom in close to one of the points. And then let me write, and you tell me if you agree, integral d for z. I shift so that here I just write z to the fourth, so I shift z by x. And now here we have z minus y plus x, or minus parentheses y minus x, same thing, to the power 4. I did nothing, right? I just, uh, I just shifted. Okay, if I just shift, I should not put the 2. So here we just shifted the counter. And now we see we have this singularity when z goes to 0, it blows up, right? So now if we are close to z equals 0, this will be approximately equal to what? So now we are studying the contribution close to z equals 0 or z equal y minus x. Because of this or, there will be a factor of 2. We just analyzed the one close to z equals 0, but the other one will be identical. Now, z close to 0 means that here I can ignore z. And because I ignore z here, I take out from the integral 1 over y minus x to the power 4. Write this from this term here. And then I still have the integral d4z over z to the 4. And this integral is what? I go to radial coordinates. It becomes an integral dr over r, very important, up to some number. This number is some pi's and so on from going to radial coordinates. But what's important is the dr over r, right? So this is r cubed dr, this is r to the 4. So when I divide, I get dr over r. And so there is a logarithmic divergence close to 0 and close to infinity that we need to regulate. So let's regulate. Let's say at very short distances, I stop at some distance epsilon. Right? That's a regulator. I say that my points stop at some distance epsilon. And what about big distances? Big distances, it's a fake divergence. This divergence was not there. At very large z, if you look here originally, z to the 4, z to the 4, z to the 8. It's super convergent at large z. This was just because we zoomed in close to z equals 0. This is OK, provided z is smaller than, is not close to the next puncture. And so the natural infrared cutoff here is absolute value of x minus y. It's, it's OK until you reach the next puncture. Right? So if you are way beyond, then forget, don't worry about it. That part is finite. Right? So this is way before the next puncture. And so this behaves, this integral, therefore, all in all, if I write it here, I can write it here, and I can say that this gives me minus twice some number, some lambda, and some logarithm of the distance x minus y divided by epsilon. Correct? Is this okay? Now, you see, this is a power law. Ah, no, you should, you should not have agreed. I forgot the, the x minus y to the 4. Minus 1 over x minus y to the 4. Right? So, this is a power law, this is a power law, this is a log. It's not a power law, right? So what's happening? This doesn't look like a correlation function of a CFT, right? Not completely, but it does. Actually, if you think a little bit more, because what is this? This is nothing but 1 over x minus y to the power 4, parenthesis, 1 minus 2 lambda, log of x minus y divided by epsilon plus dot dot dot. And this 
is nothing but epsilon divided by x minus y to the power 2 lambda to the power 2 lambda. But why did we plot a minus sign there? Why did I put a minus sign? Uh, because I want to define this with a minus sign. Whatever. It's just because I want. Just a choice of that number. I call that number minus. I prefer to put a minus here because I like uh, to have no minus here. It's ah, sorry. There is a, a number here. It's it's just defi my definition. And you agree that this stuff is just this, right? You agree? That if you expand that small lambda, you get this. When lambda is small, right? This is exponential of lambda times log of this stuff. When you expand, you get exactly this. Do you? Or maybe there is a wrong. No, it's okay. Correct. And so we conclude that indeed uh, this full expression is equal to epsilon to the power two lambda divided by x minus y to the power two times two plus whatever this number is, times lambda plus dot dot dot. Right? And so what we see is that the operator got a quantum dimension. So this was the classical dimension. And now this full thing, now we here we have the full quantum dimension. Right? And so this object is what we would call delta, the physical dimension. Whereas 2 is just delta classic. And this is the first correction. If we do more and more loops, we would correct this, and it would eventually could go to 2.2. Right? It starts at 2, and now at some lambda, you could go to 2.2, 2.3, and that's how we would generate this. More precisely now, if you wanted to bring it to the notation of the lecture, we would say that the correlation function of O of X, O of Y, our physical operators, I want to say this one is one over X minus Y to the power two delta, where delta is two plus this quantum effect plus dot, 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 and where O of X would be our operator phi square of X, which we would call the bare operator. But because of renormalization, I put here epsilon to the minus lambda. And indeed, if I divide epsilon to the lambda to the other side and absorb epsilon to the lambda in each operator, I define in this way my physical, or if you want, renormalized operator, for which the correlation function is just one divided by this. Right? And then everything is consistent. Notice that this phi at dimension one, there's no way I can change that, right? This is the physical operator, it's the dimension delta, which is quantum. And of course, it makes sense that to define it, I had to multiply the bare operator by epsilon so that I change the effective dimension of this guy. And so this object here has dimension what? Two plus lambda. And here you get two plus lambda. Okay, lambda times hashtag. I forgot probably some hashtag there, yeah. Sorry, I forgot the list. Right? And here as well. I mean this hashtag is just some pies, right? It's just it's nothing fancy. It's just I don't I don't remember the volume of a, a three sphere. Can you please show why that one is the uh, can convert it into one? Minus log. I mean, one log uh, converted to that. Yeah, so all I'm saying is that when you have a to the lambda is equal to 1 plus lambda log a plus dot dot dot. Just this, right? When lambda is small. So now I just compare and I recognize what is a, what is a there. Right? And if I put an hashtag here, I put an hashtag here.
And so, two comments here. So first, this is how quantum, how, how CFTs work in perturbation theory. You can start with the free theory. And you have to have in mind that the physical theory has no scale. That's true. It's all power loss. But the bare theory, the way you define, you, can still, you might still need a scale. You might still need to renormalize. You introduce some scale to renormalize. And you have to, you still need to renormalize your operators multiplicatively, like as usual. The, what you don't have to do is introduce a scale in the beta function and introduce mass for your fields and so on. But you still need to do some renormalization like this so that at the end, you end up without scale with just power loss. And the comment is that if you don't do a renormalized operator, then you should expect that when you compute a correlation function, you don't get just a power, you get a power with some epsilon power as well. Right? So don't expect, if you don't renormalize, to get 1 over x minus y to some number. You will get that, but you will also get some epsilon to some power. That needs to be the case by, dimension, by uh, just dimensional analysis. Right? That's important to have in mind. Now, so that was comment number one. Now, comment number two. Propagator in curved, in curved spacetime. So the claim, the answer, is the following. Let me tell you the answer, and then let's recall why this is true. Is that the propagator, when the mass of the particle is very big, the claim is that this propagator is given, I should write like this, the mass of the particle times the length that uh, this is the minimum length from point P to Q. If this is much bigger than one, you have a very heavy particle compared to the length you are probing. Then this result is approximately equal to exponential of minus mass times the length. Okay, so well, let's just remind ourselves um, a little bit, at least, uh, where this kind of thing would come about. So suppose I want to consider the propagator in a, so let's do some flat space analysis to understand, at least in flat space, how this would come about in a simple way. I have my propagator, so 1 over p squared plus m squared from point x to point y. And this would be equal to y. Then we'll use the same trick that we already used once. We consider the integral dt e to the minus t operator p squared plus m squared acting on y. No, x. Right, where we integrate this from 0 to infinity. And now the idea is to think now of this as exponential of time times some Hamiltonian, right? that I'm going to evolve for some time t. And so let's do the usual path integral trick of breaking this interval in many small pieces. So let's write this object as e to the minus epsilon p e hat square plus m square e to the minus epsilon p e hat square plus m square dot 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 e to the minus epsilon p e hat square plus m square where this epsilon is time divided by some number of steps n and there are therefore n of these factors and then uh, Let's insert the resolution of the identity. Let's insert one after and in the middle of each exponential, where this one would be just the resolution of the identity. So the integral over d a q q q. Okay, 
So let's see, but let me be more precise. Let's say I introduce identity number one, identity number two, identity number n. And then here I use some different integration variables. I use q1, q1, q1 for identity number one, etc. Let me confirm I'm using the same notation. Otherwise, in the middle, I will, I might get confused, but I think it's okay. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did it in a different way, but okay, let's hope this works as well. Let me, let me think, let me zoom out and think if this is going to work. Otherwise, I'm going in the path. I'll put identity there. And I'll get to Yeah, no, let me not do like this. Okay, so let's insert the resolution. Sorry. It's correct, of course. Everything I wrote so far is correct, but it's not a clever way of getting to the result. Yes? Let me ask what's the meaning of the one over p square? p hat square over a class m square as an operator. This? Yes. So if, it, if I go to Fourier space, this is just 1 over p square, right? This is just the usual. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw. A Fourier version of this is just 1 over the number p square plus m square. This is nothing but a starting equation of the very the very first equation I wrote in the lectures. Propagator between zero and x is equal to free transform, etc. Is this starting point? I see. I see. Sorry. This p, yeah. Right. So, yeah. This p hat it would act trivially on a momentum space, right? P is the operator that in in momentum space acts trivially. Okay, but the resolution of the identity that I want to use to make cut because I start in position space, it's more useful to use position space resolution of the identity. So sorry, I'm not introducing them in momentum space yet. I'll use them in position space first. Okay, so after we do it, we end up with the following. So we end up with an integral from 0 to infinity, d capital T, and then a product of an integration over these intermediate steps dxj, and then the, la the first is y, okay. y e to the minus epsilon p squared plus m squared, and here I put uh, x1, x1, e to the minus epsilon, p e hat square plus m square, x2, x2, etc. Up to the very last one, which would be xn, x or y, x, x.
Okay. So now what we want to compute is a building block like this. I want to compute now what happens when I have xj e to the minus epsilon p hat square plus m square xj plus 1. And here we are going to introduce again another trick. We are going to introduce here, or it doesn't matter where, but here it's good, the identity now in, in momentum space integral pj pj because then we get that this is equal to the integral dpj xj with pj pj e to the minus epsilon p hat square plus m square x j plus one now as you ask the p acting on the momentum here we get just e to the minus epsilon p j square plus m square right times p j so that's how we get rid of the operator and then we just get, we need these plane waves so this plane wave if this guy is e to the i pj xj then the plane wave that we would get from this guy and this guy would be e to the minus i pj xj plus one right one is x with p the other is p with x and so in total this quantity here would be equal to the integral over d pj e to the minus i epsilon pj square plus m square plus i pj xj minus xj plus one but this is a gaussian integral that we can just do right we just can perform this integral and we get always up to trivial factors that i don't care e to the minus i epsilon m square from com from uh, just this term here and then from completing the square plus i epsilon x i x j plus one minus x j divided by two epsilon everything squared all right okay the p squared plus m squared term didn't have any epsilon I didn't have an i, sorry, iota. So the m squared ah. cannot have an i there. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, okay, then, okay, now I'm, I will be a bit lost with the eyes, but okay, hopefully we'll survive. Okay, so now, what, uh, so we just computed these small building blocks. We saw that they are just given by this. And so we conclude that the full propagator here is equal to an integral over t from zero to infinity. And now let me write the result and you tell me if you agree or not, that now this is a discretized derivative between x at position j plus one, right? So I just have a discretized derivative. So, so I can think now of this x as a smooth curve that goes from zero to t. And so I integrate over all paths now of some curve x of t, such that x of zero is equal to x and x of capital T is equal to y. So all curves that in time t go from x to y of exponential 
of the integral dt from 0 to capital T. This term here gives me something like x dot square over 4. And this term here gives me minus m squared. Correct? Okay, so this is our propagator from point X to point Y. But we could do a little bit better than this. We could do a little bit better than this in the sense that what we did there was we divided our interval in equal spacing. Hopefully this is more or less equal spacing. But we could have divided it in many different ways, right? Why didn't we divide our integral in some unequal spacing? And the result should all be the same, right? In other words, when we have this curve, x of t, we have some t dependence. And this functional here of the curve is not invariant under t goes to f of t. If I change the way I parameterize my curve, there's no invariance. So what would have happened if we had introduced some density of points? So if we had some density e, e is sometimes called uh, Heinbein or uh, whatever. It's some name like this, Hilbein. Uh, I, I, I never know. But it's like some metric, but only four points in one dimension. Then, uh, if you had defined a metric, so this is like a metric here in one dimension to say how you discretize the points, then what you would have gotten here is that here, this metric would appear here and here. And this metric will have the property that there is now a symmetry of this action, which is when t goes to f of t, if you also transform e going to 1 over f prime of t, or just f prime of t, sorry, one sec. No, just f prime. f prime of t, e. Sorry, one sec. Something is wrong here. Yeah, no, it's one over. Okay, right? so if you transform like this, then this metric is invariant now. Now, the result here, now we would have our coordinates. And now we have also some non-dynamical metric in the sense that you can choose whatever metric you want. You can pick any metric you want along the curve, right? The result doesn't matter, it's invariant. And so in particular, you could integrate over all possible metrics. Right? You could just integrate over all possible metrics. And the metric is non-dynamical. It contains no kinetic term. Right? It just it, it appears without derivatives. And so we could now extremize over epsilon, over this non-dynamical field. And if you do it, if you take, if you compute the extremum of that action, you would get something like x dot square over epsilon square, the derivative of the first term, is equal 
to m squared, the derivative of the second term. And so you would conclude that if you would extremize over this matrix, you would get that the matrix that extremizes is the matrix m squared divided by the square root of x dot square. Correct? And therefore, when you plug this matrix back here, no, the inverse of this. Thank you. And therefore, when we plug back here, we conclude that the propagator from point X to point Y is equal to the integral over all possible fields that go from x to y. Notice that now I'm not specifying how long it takes. I'm not saying it takes time t. I don't need to now anymore, as you will see. Times exponential of minus m times the integral of square root of d x mu d x mu and this is nothing but the length of the curve right you get normally it will be x dot square times dt which i just wrote like this to make manifest that it's just a line element so it's Right, so this is nothing but I can also write if you want square root of x squared dot square dt. But what this makes manifest is that this is manifest if parameterization invariant doesn't care about the parameterization, right? T goes to f of t, this is invariant. And it's invariant because it's a physical object, it is just the length of the curve. So I just need to sum over all curves that go from x to y and weight them by e to the minus the length of the corresponding curve. That's it. That's the usual quantum mechanical sum over all possible paths that go from one point to the other. But now what happens is the mass is very big and the length is very big. Then what, ma what happens is that only the classical path matters, right? And so this becomes approximately equal to e to the minus mass times the minimal length. Now you see what happens if you add a general metric. Mr. What did we, means we said mass to be very large, and then we said only is what happened the classical. Metric. Only the instead of summing over all paths, you can just take the extremal path, right? You are doing an integral over all paths, right? But the one is less suppressed than the other; that one dominates. You just do it by saddle point. It's a classical limit. This is quite the mechanics, you sum over all paths, but in practice only one dominates. That's what happens in the real world, right? If I throw, throw this chalk, I see one path. It's this. But how does the mass being large come in there? It's the fact that you need the action to be big. If the action is small, all paths matter, right? That's when quantum mechanics is important. Quantum mechanics becomes classical mechanics when the action is big. Yeah. The action is big when the mass is big. Or more physically, because mass has dimensions. So saying mass is, phys is big, uh, you should tap me. Right? So the mass times the length to make it dimensionless. So when the, ma when the length measured in units of the mass uh, is big. So the physical quantity is mass times length. Okay, so this is the length of the curve that goes from x to y. There are many such curves. The minimum one will give the extremal result. And you see right away that what would generalize, the way you would find if you would have a discrete, if you have a space time, you have to discretize the momentum locally, it's the same thing. But at the end of the day, the length of the curve is still giving locally by exactly the same expression, but in total, the global expression is different. In other words, what do you have to do? You just have to do here, instead of doing dx mi dx nu times e to mu nu, you just put a general metric g mu nu. 
You just did local, it's always eta mu nu, right? You can always diagonalize and it looks always like eta mu nu. But globally, tak, 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 it will be the total length of the curve. And so all you have to do is go here and put the length, whatever curve you have here. And then the result is the same. It's still e to the minus length of the minimal curve in curved space time that connects points x and y. OK. Where, so this is. Where did the integral of the capital T go? It disappeared because I'm connecting all, now. That integral over t, it's automatically incorporated in the choice of metrics. I'm just saying I discretize. I have curves that go from a zero. There is no more time. Time appeared because we chose a discretization, and we said there are n steps because I choose n tick marks. As soon as I say there is an arbitrary metric, and I integrate out, I get this expression. You see, this expression is, or this, is parameterization invariant. It doesn't matter, right, what t is. You choose. You can say that t now lives in an interval between 0 and 1, or between 0 and 1,000, right? There's no more natural parameterization. There's not, no more natural number of steps. Because now we introduce the metric, and everything is physical. It's now coordinate-free. Is it OK? Anyway, I know it. Uh, so the punchline here is that the propagator in a curved space-time from a point p to a point q is approximately equal to exponential of minus the mass to the length of the minimal path that connects p with q. And so in quantity, and OK, if you want, that's a classical or semi-classical result valid in any curved space-time that tells you that the propagation for large fields it's a geometrical problem of finding the minimal distance between two points. And so finally, we can now turn and do some exercise and start thinking about quantum field theory in ADS. We can start putting quantum fields in, AV in ADS. We have anti-sitter space. We can now put quantum fields in ADS and start doing some computations in quantum fields inside ADS. And the computation we are going to imagine putting is let's put some heavy scalar field phi in ADS. Because now we know how to deal with heavy particles in any space time, in particular in ADS. Yes? You mean heavy in units of like the ADS radius or? Um, I did not discuss ADS radius yet. So you are jumping ahead a little bit. So it would be heavy in the same sense as I mean heavy here. So it would be a particle that's much heavier than the lengths that will be involved in the computations that I'm considering. OK, so we, have, we will have some heavy particles in ADS. If you want some classical particles in ADS, some rocks in this curved space time. And they will behave like classical rocks in this curved space time. They will follow geodesics and will be dealing with finding minimal lengths of these rocks. And now there is the following claim. Let's consider ADS. So we have here the boundary of ADS. And here there is the interior of ADS, also called the bulk. And then there is the following claim that if I consider geodesics in this space time, minimal curves in this space time, they are arcs of circle that go from the boundary to the boundary. So this is a geodesic in Euclidean antidesitter. More precisely, let's work out what that would mean here. So let's work out Euclidean antidesitter two-dimensional. So if it's two dimensional to the center, it means it's one dimension. It's R1 with an extra dimension. So the metric is just dz squared plus dx squared over x squared. It's just a two dimensional metric. Right? And what's the Lagrangian for a point particle here? The Lagrangian would be just the integral dt square root of x dot square, what I wrote there, which is z dot square plus x dot square over x square. Right? I just compute this, that quantity there, that square root over there. 
right? It's just this, I convert this into z dot, this x dot, that's the, that's the, the action, right? Just the length of this curve. Now, this will give me a curve that if this is x and this is z, then there will be some curve here. But you see that it's up to us to choose the parameterization we want. I can choose any parameterization, right? So this is parameterization invariance. So a clever parameterization we have is to use z, instead of using x of t and z of t, let's use the parameterization where x of t is just t, and therefore z is just z of x, and that's it. Right? So then we just parameterize directly given some x, I tell, we tell what is z. Then this action becomes just the integral over dx square root of z prime square plus 1 divided by x square. Yes? Your metric? Uh, ah, sorry. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, every, it's clear to everyone. I hope no one was confused by this. Okay. Now we have this Lagrangian, right? And we just now have the usual equations of motion that follow from this Lagrangian, right? Let's just write the first one. So it's the first one, the only one. So derivative with respect to x, a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to z prime. So it gives something like z prime. <laughs> over z square divided by the square root is equal, okay, I'm not going to do the details, derivative with respect to z of the square root. Okay. And the claim is that this solution, the, the solution to this equation will be z equal to square root of x square minus uh, some constant x0 square. Okay, you solve, just solve this equation and you get this. This you are going to be doing in the, the, in the homework. So then you conclude that the geodesic is this arc of circle. Right? So z, z describes this arc of circle. And then you can ask what's the length of this curve? Right? What's the propagator from a point here to a point here? Well, it is just the length of this geodesic, right? Now I know the propagator from point P to point Q. Because I know this geodesics, I know this is the minimal length, so now we know the propagator between any point P and any point Q. Right? Why any? Because any two points, I can draw a circle that passes by them, right? So I, now I know the propagator between any two points. So this we, you know when you are going to work this out in the class. Now, what's interesting now, is to consider the case where these points P and Q, they approach the end point of the geodesic. Let P go here, and let Q go here. Huh? In other words, we make P and Q approach the boundary. They are approaching the boundary. Then, uh, when they do, the length of this curve that goes from P to Q, okay, becomes equal to if this separation here is x, and if they stop at some distance here from the boundary epsilon, becomes equal to logarithm of x over epsilon. That's a geometric result in it, yes. The length of this geodesic between these points is log of minus x over x. Yeah. And therefore, you conclude that the propagator with, from point P to point Q, when these now are approaching the boundary of ADS, 
So you have like two points approaching at the boundary of ADS. It's approximately equal to e to the minus the mass times log of absolute value of x over epsilon. But that's nothing but epsilon. So the m, actually there is a 2. Because I want, and because it's there. Epsilon to the 2m divided by absolute value of x to the power 2m. And this is a remarkable result, right? Because this is like what you have exactly as expected for a conformal field theory. Right? So it looks like you start with a theory with massive particles. You add some massive particles in ADS. And as these points approach the boundary, and if you only ask about correlation functions from point P1 to point P2 at the boundary, the behavior of that correlation function is a power law where the dimension of my field is the mass of the particle that I put in ADS. And so we are getting a CFT. Uh, it looks like we are getting a CFT. What we are seeing here is not ADS CFT, but is, it looks to be something like ADS. We started ADS, and it implies, it gives a CFT. It's not a duality yet. It's not a precise map. It's not a dictionary, but it's something. We started ADS. We started to do computations in ADS, and we carry points to the boundary, and the result we get are results that look like the results of a CFT. What is more, and that you are also going to do it uh, in the homework, is you could now imagine even considering the case where you have the boundary of ADS. And just to see if it's a coincidence or not, you could now consider three points that are approaching the boundary. So how would you imagine how the computation going if you have three points? So imagine generalizing what I said for two points. When you have a general space time and you have three points. So three points, they need to interact, right? So if you have a cubic interaction, you have like a particle that decays into two. Right? Where does it decay? What should I think now from this point of view? I have a part, I have three particles that they have to interact somewhere. Where do they interact? Exactly, they interact in the bulk in some point, but where? And what trajectory do they follow till the point where they interact? Think physically. What do you expect physically? Where should they, what should they try to do? Collide. Sorry? Collide. collide, but where? There are many points. They can collide here, they can collide here, they can collide here. Where do they choose to collide? Where the lens is the minimum. To the sun. Exactly. Where you would have to compute the three, the length, you would have to to try to compute each guy here, you would compute the sum of the mass of particle i times the length from point at the boundary pi to the intersection point x. This, you compute this length from the point, right? And this would be our, your action. And then you have to extremize this section. Find the point which leads to the best the minimal uh, sum of lengths times masses. And so you minimize this action S. That gives you X. Right? And you plug this X into the action. And you get the classical action where the three points meet at the optimal point that minimizes the length, right? And then you ask, what is the result of the three-point function, which is approximately equal to e to the minus this classical action, right? Now I just have the three propagation. And okay, what, what would be a spectacular result to finish this lecture? that you would get the result of a three-point function in a CFT.
with exactly the space dependence that we said, x1 minus x2 to the power delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, exactly as you expect for a CFT. Okay. So that's the suggestion for uh, the homework. And uh, as I thought, we would start and then five minutes over time.